Hi, and welcome to Affected, a podcast from me. For those of you who don't know me, we are a global life sciences talent provider. We've been connecting the industry for over a decade, and now we want to share some of our insights and experiences with you. We'll be hosting monthly episodes, sharing thoughts from our leaders and industry professionals about job hunting and hiring in life sciences, as well as giving our network a platform to share their own experiences of building successful careers in an industry that affects us all. Hey, and welcome to a very special uh, episode of the Affected Podcast. I'm out here on the New York uh, in the New York office, and. As I'm recording this, this is my last day here. I've been here for a couple of days, and I'm still trying to devise a way where I don't actually have to um, don't actually have to go home because I'm just having way way too much fun. Probably too much fun, more than I should be. But best city is. in the world. Best city in the world. Yeah. It's pretty. It's it's up there. I'm joined by three amazing human beings. I've got Caitlin, uh, Savannah, and Banksy. Um, who, by the way, did you? If you watched the last podcast, both Matt and Goo said you'd be so much better than them. Oh, is that right? Oh. Yeah, so <laughs> no pressure. So the then, bar's I suppose, incredibly yeah. high right now. <laughs> um, can you just tell me a little bit about yourselves? How long you've been here? The markets you work in, and, yeah. and sort of you know the best things about working for me, I suppose. Yeah, so I'll start us off. I'm uh, division director for the contract division. I've been at Meet for coming up to nine years now. I'm um, started off in our medcoms um, division in London. There was about 25 people at Meet when I joined. Um, and then I came over here to lead our contract division now. So, um, yeah, we've grown for, to, what is it, over 200 now globally. So it's definitely seen this company grow from the ground up, which is exciting. What about yourself? Um, as Owen said, I'm Caitlin. Um, I'm a division manager here, and I specialize in full-time employment, specifically within clinical development, medical affairs, and a program management. So... I've been here now for four and a half years, which I probably already said, but have a team of three underneath me, and it's definitely been a humbling and, and great journey along the way. What about yourself? Yeah, so I've been here for um, just over a year and a half. I head up our um, contract division. I work across a few different verticals at the moment, um, some being clinical operations, regulatory affairs, as well as quality assurance. And um, it's really just been a really rewarding experience um, getting to connect the top talent to the clients um, that are looking for it. You're like a LinkedIn queen as well, aren't you? I swear, like, you're like <laughs> the, the person that everyone at the company points out, hey, I mean, like, you're knocking Glenn off his perch, which is quite, uh, which is quite a big deal. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I kind of took an opportunity and ran with it. I've always heard that um, personal branding can take you pretty far um, within the life sciences specifically. So I saw an opportunity that not many people have done um, within this business specifically. So yeah, I'm really excited to um, continue to grow my personal brand. I think that's something we, we, we push really hard here is sort of just trying something new, sort of maybe a lot of people get a tendency to suck in that, get stuck in their own ways and just, just push the boat out. And especially when, when the markets are a little bit more challenging, that's probably the most important thing. You've got to reinvent, stay uh, mobile and, and move around. And, and in that suit, today we're going to be talking about the best ways to attract that top, top level talent and how to engage them um, in, in what is essentially a very, very candidate driven market at the moment. Um, I know some of you guys work in incredibly candidate driven markets. Um, you just sort of talk about that a little yeah so especially in clinical development and medical affairs I've found that the candidates kind of um, rule the markets for the clients here and what that really means it's it's a market where clients struggle to find that top talent and specifically within that it's the skill set that these candidates are bringing forward and finding them through the avenues that the resources the avenues and resources that these clients do have can be difficult. So typically reaching out to external sources is where you're going to be able to find that top talent and we're going to be able to put the time and effort in to scourging the market to find that, that niche candidate for them. What would you say are some of the key challenges that, are, that are, our clients are facing when they're you know, trying to attract that top level talent, especially when we're trying to sort of attract that talent into time critical roles? I think the biggest challenge a lot of companies have faced is like the, just the sheer number of, especially in the biotech space who works so much in that area, just the sheer number of companies who all need the same people. Yeah. So just trying to differentiate themselves in a way 
um, that's going to mean that they're going to want to join their company. I know that a lot of people um, that we speak to, the first thing they want to look at is like a company's pipeline, right? So it's like, okay, I want to see the pipeline. What are they working on? Is it exciting? Is it something that's going to be really interest me? Um, so, I mean, some companies don't even have their pipeline on their website. So definitely having the pipeline on there. Um, but other than that, how else you can talk about the exciting journey that you're on as a business. I feel like you can do that a lot through social media. I see some companies and biotechs announcing, we just hired a new chief medical officer, they've come from this company, this is what we're looking to achieve. Other companies you know, don't do any of the social media presence and it's, it may be a bit harder to you know, generate that excitement of the journey that they're on. I think, that's one of the, I think that's one of the things that really sort of struck me when, when we were talking about um, your work in clinical development yeah. was that sort of, yes, the, the, the compensation package that you're, you can offer is fantastic, but the idea that you really have to buy into the science, you, ha you have to sort of really sell what you're working on to get, to get these top level life science professionals to get through, you know, through the door. Yeah, and I mean, ultimately, it's with any company. If you don't believe in a purpose, why are you going to want to join? I mean, even here with me, I remember when I was coming to join the company, I wanted to back and resonate with the company's values, with their morals, and with the work that they were putting forward. And it's the same on the candidate side. If a candidate is looking at a pipeline, looking at the science, and they don't believe in it ultimately, why would they want to work on that program? So companies who are able to offer up, like Paul was saying, those innovative assets, the cutting edge therapies, that's what's going to get candidates interested even if there is an essential risk factor with them being a startup or with them not having a ton of financial runway. If they can believe it, you can sell it. So that's ultimately, I think, the, one of the main drivers. Massively. I, I mean, th this really is an industry where, you, you know, we're, we're dealing with life-changing individuals, people who are going to go on to do just ridiculously phenomenal things cure cure diseases and, and things like that so without believing in that it, it must be so difficult to just to, to get to get people through the door mm -hmm. i think um another another aspect i'd like to talk about outside of compensation because obviously money money's fantastic but there, there are factors outside of that and you know we just came through one of the most bizarre periods of, of our existence you know the, the pandemic was was nuts for all of us but the one thing it did sort of bring up was the the idea of remote working so did you know that between um the beginning of march 2020 and the end of 2021 remote working rose by 1117 percent wow. which is a ridiculous number yeah. so um how important do you think sort of that role in uh, remote working hybrid working is right now for, for life sciences professionals yeah like you said with the jump um, in the recent like months and the last year I definitely think it's really important because um, people have kind of adjusted their lifestyle to that remote work and that flexibility I think um, the more clients do offer that um, remote work or even just like flexible hours um, candidates are really realizing that um, it's something really exciting to be a part of because even though they're able to be a part of those cutting edge therapies and really making a difference. They're also able to have that balance and spend some time with their family as well as their hobbies. Um, so I think it's just really, really important to, when it's possible, um, be able to offer some type of flexibility. Yeah, I was gonna say to bridge off that on the client side too, you wanna be competitive with what other clients are offering out there. And you know, if you have a candidate going through the process who ultimately has two offers in front of them, identical compensation, similar assets. Are they gonna pick the one where they have to be five days on site or are they going to pick the one that offers them to have that work-like balance? In terms of compensation, like 46% of people who were um, surveyed said that they would actually choose, would, would take a 5% pay cut for an opportunity to work remotely, which I, which I find incredible, especially in a world where usually, you know, salary is king. The idea that now we're sort of more branching out a little bit more into, you know, striving for a better work-life balance and things like that. I just thought that was a really interesting statistic. Yeah, I feel like with that, people look at it as like the time of their commute. They see the value in that, right? If they're doing a 30 minute commute, some of them, if you're in Boston, you might have to pay for parking or whatever it might be. Um, but yeah, that, that time that it takes to commute is one thing, um, but also the cost of a commute. If you're getting a train, so like 5% off a salary, like I said, may not, may not be that much when you're working from remotely and you take it off that way, yeah. We, we work in markets that are incredibly skill set driven. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, and, and those skill sets are in high demand. They're, they're niche areas, niche verticals. Um, obviously, compensation plays a huge role in sort of bringing someone on board. Um, how can companies create competitive compensation packages? And, you know, what do we see out there that convinces people to accept offers? Yeah. Honestly, I think it what it comes down to, of course, people want to see the numbers ultimately at the end of the day, but it's what comes behind those numbers. And what I mean by that is when candidates take a look at the offer, they're taking a look at that as how that company feels and respects their experience. So if you want to compete with top talent, you want to afford top talent, you're going to need to be able to provide multiple parts of a compensation package that's going to make fiscal sense to them. So breaking it down, there's of course going to be a base salary that comes into that, a yearly target bonus. If a company is public, either RSUs or options to be able to round out a solid equity package for them. If it's private, offering up the option for when they go public that you can have a stake in the company, especially with these smaller biotechs who are looking to be the next best thing. You may not have the big punchy numbers to throw a huge salary at these individuals, but if you're offering them a stake in the company and it's something they believe in, that just shows how much you value their work. And that's what it comes down to. The amount of candidates that I've spoken to in the market who they've gotten an offer from another company and they just say, you know, I just don't feel respected by that offer. And if that's how the way that they see me, I don't want to go towards that company. So to really be competitive in this area, you need to have some form of base, short-term incentive, and long-term incentive. On top of that, of course, benefits, 401k. But people need to see their longevity in a company. That's really interesting. I've never thought about the idea of um, equity being used as a, as a sort of compensation package. Is that sort of mainly within that biotech space? I would say it's relied heavily within the biotech space, but you see it within the big pharma world as well. Um, you know, the likes of your, your Pfizer's, your AbbVie's, you know, they're all going to put together some type of compensation package that involves equity because it's also a way to retain your employees. Um, going on these vesting schedules of three or four years, you're going to want to stay in that organization to see that, that big pay cut. Would you say it's important that, you know, the, the, the clients that we work with sort of keep a finger on the pulse of what's happening within the world of life sciences at the moment, i.e. What, what are their competitors doing? What, what are the salaries that those guys are offering? What, what kind of benefits are they offering? Is, is that something that they should be keeping like one eye on? Definitely, because as I said, everyone's looking for the same thing. Um, so if you aren't competitive, and then you are going to get found out and you're just, you're just going to see offers get rejected. Um, so I think sometimes it's like, where do you find this information? Like, how do you know what you know what other companies are offering and I think that's where you know recruitment providers or talent services out there they have a big network of these things they know what other people are getting offered because they're just really well networked within the industry so sometimes people think oh I don't need a talent agency because we're looking to you know get our talent through our internal sources but it's like okay but do you how do, how well do you how well are your eyes and ears in the industry to, to say can make sure you're competitive not even just from a compensation standpoint but what are people asking in terms of working from home right now? Is, is our expectation asking too much? These types of things I think are important when they find that right person that they know is the future of their company, that they need to make sure that that person accepts their offers. I think that's the one great thing we do here at Meet is we, we built a whole insights and success, success division um, purely to help our candidates and clients sort of understand what is actually happening at the market. And that's, again, like you're saying, one of the best things about partnering with a talent agency is, you know, that network that you're immediately opened up to, the, the 13, 14, 15 years of experience within, within that um, space. And, and especially us at Meet, we are life science specific. We have been in this space for so long. You know, we just have that reach that you may not have on your own, which is totally fine because not everyone you can't just go home, jump on a computer, and then have a network of, of you know hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people on a, on a system. And that also, in turn, to add on to that with me, you know, of course we're life science specialized, but we're also sectored off by vertical. So you know, I think it's something very special and something that may set us apart a little bit from our competitors because we're able to actually report on that data. 
at a high level because I'm only speaking to people within clinical development and medical affairs. I have a direct line on the pulse when if you want to go and hear about the rates for certain contractors, go to Savannah or, or Banksy to be able to hear more and more on what that really is going to look like in the market. T talking about contractors, are the, the candidates you work with in the space looking for maybe different things to possibly someone in a more permanent setting looking for? Definitely. I think when you're a contractor, um, you know, hourly rate is one of the main reasons a lot of people go contract. Um, flexibility as well. Um, but they also don't want to get too involved with the company politics, people call it, right? By being a contractor, you just get to do what you do best. You don't have to worry about interviewing or all of these other things that come in with being an employee. So sometimes they do like to be detached. They like to have, give their advice and, and get their advice to, um, you know, implemented as well. It can get frustrating for contractors if they're brought in to give advice and then the stance is that they, it doesn't want to be used and that's sometimes where contractors get a bit frustrated. Um, but I think, you know, one of the things, I and mean, just coming back to the hourly rate, they do want, you know, a strong hourly rate and there are times where clients of ours will want to, you know, test that a little bit and be like, you know, they are available though, so why wouldn't they take a little bit less? Now, I'd always err on the side of caution with that because, yes, they might accept that contract there and then, but, you know, three months down the line, two weeks down the line even, when another company calls with just as the same kind of role, but they're offering the rate that they normally charge, they will go like that. Um, and that's why when you get someone who is strong, you, you just want to offer them what is their competitive rate, and, and that's really one of the things they're most, they care about most. Aside from that, I would say, the number of hours of working worked a week, I think commitment. Some some contractors, you know, if they are gonna say that they want to commit, they're gonna want to know that there's a stable amount of work there. Um, if you're gonna want them to not take any other contracts on, you're gonna really have to make sure that you're giving them 40 hours a week. If you're happy with them working other contracts, that's definitely an advantage as well because, again, they can under they can kind of balance their workload a little bit better that way. So there's definitely a lot of different more dynamics to contract, but that gives you maybe. A bit of an insight to a few. Savannah, do you, do you often get much pushback from your clients sort of in regards to um, the things that Banksy was talking about, you know, maybe see, trying to get them on a lower rate or for more time, those kinds of things. Is that something you see often? Yeah, to be honest, um, it definitely depends on the role as well as the client. Um, but I do see pushback in terms of hourly rate as well as working hours. Um, of course, the candidate's looking for something specific, but so is the client. Um, sometimes the client will only have budget for a certain amount of hours or they'll only have budget um, to go up to a certain hourly rate. But again, um, it's just important to kind of stress and back your candidates up in that situation and just let them know that um, they could be secured for um, that specific rate if they're looking for for that niche talent because again with contractors a lot of the times they're looking for a really unique expertise that not anyone can just bring to the table mm -hmm. so I think it's really important to just reiterate um, the fact that they're really looking for that unique expertise and it's right here in front of them um, so it might be better to just boost that hourly rate by five or ten dollars rather than starting the process mm -hmm. all over again and um, having to go back to the talent pool and the drawing board. I guess that's the thing isn't it time is time is money and you know pay a little bit more, get the, guy, get the, get the contract you want and, and get started on that exciting project and, and really get the ball rolling. I think one of the things that fascinates me about, about the contract market is just, yes, you're bringing someone in with a fantastic skill set who's gonna, gonna achieve that job, but some of the people we work with have been contractors for decades who, who have been on you know, hundreds of projects. Just having a really talented individual in your team can sort of elevate the level that everyone else is around you to a, to a much higher bar. And I think that sort of just demonstrates the importance, importance of getting the right person in, sometimes regardless of, of the rate, right? So, you know, conversation, fantastic benefits, uh, is fantastic, but ultimately you are going to be working within a company, um, be it for a, for a limited period of time or hopefully for, you know, years and years and years and years. And I, I feel like one of the most important things, um, especially for me, and I think maybe for all of us who, who work here at Meet, is the culture within the company that we are moving into. Mm -hmm. to, to have those, like, um, your, uh, your cultures align is, is incredibly important. And, you know, can you guys speak on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I'll start it off with just like a, a brief quote that I learned actually from my division director that I now say to my candidates and my clients when I speak with them is, 
you know, you could make all the money in the world, but if you don't like who you work for, you're not going to stay. And ultimately, I think a driving force within that is going to come back to the company's values and respect that they are putting forward. I think a huge thing that comes up in speaking with candidates and that I've heard on feedback from clients is transparency. And I think that's a huge thing that clients should be driving throughout the interview process to secure these candidates. And that's transparency within the collaboration and teams. That's transparency with the science and what's ongoing in their clinical trials. Because if a candidate joins a company and all of a sudden they're seeing behind the curtains and it's not what they were represented before, they're going to feel like they were led with a false belief or false hope ultimately. So I would say transparency is the number one thing to drive forward in a culture in particular for me. Yeah, even like off the back of that, off the back of transparency, I think it's also important where people feel like they have a voice and they feel like um, their opinion is valued. Um, I know a lot of company culture has talked about in terms of like company lunches, company happy hours, um, but I think company culture really boils down to do you enjoy coming to work every day and do you feel respected and valued and does your opinion like really matter um, so I think clients and companies really um, need to think about that in terms of their own company culture mm -hmm. yeah and I think from from my side there's one client I remember specifically um, they told me they had a need for a regulatory person with orphan disease and IND submission experience um, but they told me that they would not be interested unless they would fit in line with the culture and mm -hmm. the culture was quite strong it was very much that everyone needs to be respectful of everyone all of the time mm -hmm. is their kind of mantra um, and that meant that like if you know you might have all the experience but we're not going to bring someone into the business whether they have the right skill set or even if they're just a consultant that will join two or three meetings a week there's a risk that if they aren't bringing that respect to the meeting and to every individual in the meeting that could really disrupt the culture the environment and you could lose some really good people so i think having a strong company culture and mantra like that was was really powerful yeah i would definitely agree with that and i think something that clients should take stock of in that too when they're sending on that message is that when candidates are coming through to interview yes you're interviewing that candidate about the culture but that candidate's also interviewing you to ensure that this is a relationship that's going to work on their side so it's a, just a cyclical I think I read a quote which was something along the lines of every every time you meet with someone, it's an opportunity to search, to showcase your business mm -hmm. and and the kind of business you are, and that starts at not, not even the interview like process, the the job application process, you know, sort of how long does it take to get back to someone? Um, do we do we hand you know feedback back? Those those kinds of things. I think it's it's so important to make sure that you know if you're going to be spending an awful lot of time within a company, it's it, it's the perfect place for you. I mean, money's fantastic, but you're right. If you're if you're not willing to come to work, then is it is it really worth it? Mm -hmm. Essentially. So we talked about transparency, um, sort of, and I think one of the one of the big things there is talking about what career progression looks like within a company. Um, a work institute survey said that the biggest reason that a lot of people leave is because there is no clear progression within the company. No clear um, career development mm -hmm. um, obviously with contractors things are a little bit different but on the permanent side would you say that's sort of like a main factor 100 percent i would say it really depends from what i've seen in terms of size of company um, many people who are at big pharmas they may not receive the same growth opportunities because there are so many other people competing internally for that one role that's a level above so when they're in the market and they're looking for a new opportunity they're looking for that next title and I think in organizations that are looking to grow and companies who are looking to form their internal structures making multiple levels is so important because someone moving into a company needs to be able to see that this is going to be my home for the next three to five years or even down the line they're going to have to be able to see individuals moving up within that company quickly they're going to have to see that that those levels in between exist for them or else on the permanent side you're only going to be there for a year's time and that's not what people want on the permanent side they're looking for a home yeah looking for a home i, I think that's you, can, yeah. you can't really say it any better right it's it's somewhere where and especially in this industry industry it's somewhere where you have the opportunity to, to make a difference. And I think that's, you know, 
one of the reasons we're all in this, right, is to, is to be part of that process and, and to genuinely make a difference. Could you each give us one piece of advice that you would give to a life sciences company out there that would help them um, lure in that top level talent, um, especially in this current job market? Yeah, I would say, I definitely think it's going to be really hard to do it without agency support. You're just not going to have the eyes and ears in the market as, as, you, as you need. And you're not going to have the network in all areas where you might need to grow. Um, so I feel like, yeah, working with, you know, a company like Meet, you know, that's where you can have um, that, that, those aspects um, that are going to really help you. But I also think that the, the talent provider that you choose, you do need to understand the how it affects your brand like you want a company that really represents your brand believes in the pipeline that you have because that's really you know what's going to happen you're going to be they're going to be speaking to the individuals so you're really going to want to trust them in that way yeah <laughs> i definitely agree with with paul there and another piece of advice i would give besides you know partnering and specifically with me is for those niche churches that they have out there is looking to move to a retained service and what I mean by that and it's actually something that we do offer here at me it's an additional arm to our business but a retained service is going to provide you market mapping it's going to provide you quicker fill time and it's going to provide the candidates with a sense of security in working with these high level candidates these candidates who want to be made to feel special you have to make them feel special and falling into that you can't have eight different recruitment agencies reaching out to them about the same role. You want to find one trusted partner who's going to be able to act as an extension of your HR, not as just another recruitment agency that you see every day. You want them to be a part of your business. And that's really resonated with me when Paul was saying that they represent your value and your brand because we're here to be consultants. We're not just here to be recruiters. We're here to help them on their hiring needs in that way. Yeah, definitely. And going off the back of um, what both Caitlin and Paul said, a lot of hiring managers as well as HR, um, they're really busy people. They don't have the time and the energy to just put that all out into um, searching for top talent. That's kind of where we come in and we're able to kind of alleviate that from them. Um, as well as we, this is what we do um, daily. This is routine for us. We're networking consistently with top talent in the market and it just really alleviates a lot of time, stress and pressure from um, those hiring managers and people at the top um, for us to kind of come in, do the hard, consistent work that they don't want to do on a daily basis. And at the end of the day, they're left with that top talent um, that they were searching for in the first place. And I think for me, um, especially when, when the market is a bit like this, think outside the box, do something that you've never done before. If, if you have a time critical um, project and you've never considered a contractor, hey, maybe, maybe, maybe consider a contractor, maybe use the retained services you know, you know it, it, there's so much that we can do as, as, as a talent provider that you may not have even thought of. Um, and, you know, this is the perfect opportunity to lean on fantastic people like these guys and, and to really sort of help you get the best talent through the door. I think the biggest thing and message that I try to always send, and I know Savannah and, and Paul do as well, is we're here to form a real partnership. And that partnership can look different in different organizations. It could just be a contract partnership. It could be a large volume partnership or retained or contingent. But we're here to offer the service that works best for you and tailor our search process to make it work for you. Because we want longevity in that partnership as well. Yeah, and to add to that, that's what it's about. It's about our, our flexibility from our side, right? Because ultimately, you know, it might be the case that you only need someone for 20 hours a week and there's some other com competitors of ours or other options of vendors where, you know, it doesn't matter how many hours that person works a week, we're going to bill you this amount. Whereas for us, you know, especially like medical writing, for example, it's very much up and down. You know, it's hours worked, hours paid when it comes to contract with meat. Um, and also there's a lot of flexibility to take contractors directly. And I think for a lot of our biotech clients, temp to perm is a really, really attractive model. And especially when, you know, with interviewing these days, you're not going to get to meet them in person. So the best way to actually get to know someone that you're going to hire is to actually work with them for three to six months. Um, and a lot of, 
you know, I'd say most of the business we do with biotechs that is contract, there always is the idea that they are going to want to hire them um, at some point, and we don't provide any obstacle to them bringing them in full time, um, and we're very flexible with the longer that they work, the more flexibility there is with our fees. That's some incredible insight. I feel like every time I talk to talk to you guys, I learn a little bit more <laughs> about, about the industry. Um, so all that's left for me to say is to say thanks to, to you guys for just being phenomenal. I know, I know, especially you, Caitlin, I've dragged you on camera so much over the past few days. You're becoming, I, I swear you're like the face of the franchise now. Yeah. I mean, I wish I had a better voice right now to go, <laughs> to go ahead and do that. But, you know, I'll take my, my camera time where I can. So, we, they, so two, two people on, on, on these sofas were at two very different concerts over the last 24 hours. One of them was <laughs> T-Pain and the other one was Shania Twain. And I'll, I'll let you guess <laughs> who was who in that situation. Um, honestly, guys, thank you so much. The insight, as, as always, from, from you guys is incredible. I, I, I feel that's the one great thing about working here at Meet is we have this innate ability just to hire fantastic human beings. And, and I can't thank you guys enough for joining me. Well, right back at you, You're Owen. too kind, Owen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having us. I'm doing my best to just to butt these guys up so they keep me in the real pocket. That's exactly it. Come back. I'm, I'm trying my best. <laughs> <laughs> We'll see you next month with another episode of the Affected Podcast. Uh, and once again, we want to hear um, what topics you'd like us to talk about. We, we are here to be a resource for you. So if there's a pressing issue that you really want us to discuss, something that you want to know more about, whether it's a specific look at retained searches mm -hmm. or, you know, exactly what a contractor can offer to, to you, drop it down in the comments um, and we will grab the right people on and we'll talk about it in depth, especially for you. Like and subscribe. I can't believe I've got to say that now. That I feel, <laughs> I feel like a YouTuber, like a real YouTuber. Thank you guys, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.